Something odd is happening in China. There are protests happening all over. People are boycotting, paying EMIs. And one of the largest real estate developers is probably going bankrupt. We saw this in 2008 in the US. And in this video, we're going to talk about what happened in the US in 2008, what's happening in China today, and what could happen in India if things fall bad. Let's understand what happened in 2008. We know that Nifty fell 50%, but what exactly transpired was simply this. And we have three people to blame. We have real estate developers, we have banks and their unlimited greed, and people who wanted to buy houses they just simply couldn't afford. Simply put, people were allowed to buy houses for a price that they could not afford. Now imagine the bank saying, you can buy this house and you have to pay a very low interest rate. And even though your credit score is really, really low, we'll still allow you to buy this house. And these suboptimal or subprime mortgages, which are bank loans, were given to all these people. Everyone was happy. People were paying their interests in time, sort of, and they did this at a huge scale. And this just kept going up and up, higher and higher. Now, apart from this, the banks wanted to make even more money out of this pile of home loans. And they took this and they sold it as an investment product. It was like a mutual fund investment, but for rich people. They bought this entire security and said, hey, here it is. All these guys will pay an interest rate to you and you'll make some money. People bought it. Then someone else came and sold it to someone else for a different price. And they kept building on top of this. So the securities were built on top of mortgages of people who bought houses which they could not afford. Now, at some point, something went wrong and they couldn't pay the EMI and the entire thing went kaboot. And that was the 2008 crisis. Now, Lehman Brothers, one of the largest banks in the country, lost $3 billion in just three months. That was actually a small amount. When that bank, and it was the largest bank back then, went bankrupt, they had $619 billion in debt. <coughs> I'll say that again. $619 billion in debt for just that one company. So you can imagine what all the banks together would have lost. Now, three things happened which turned this into a financial crisis. This is not enough to turn the entire world down, right? The first thing was that there was unprecedented growth. There were lots of people offered loans who took lots of debt to actually buy these houses. And when all of them defaulted, the thing went kaput. The second thing was adjustable rate mortgages. Basically, it means the bank can change the interest rate depending on how the market moves. So imagine you had to pay 5,000 rupees EMI this month, but after a few months, the bank says, no, now it's 10,000, then it became 15, 20. And because it changed, people just couldn't afford it because the adjustable rate mortgages just didn't make sense for someone who just couldn't afford it. I mean, he shouldn't have bought that house in the first place. And finally, Put this all together at a really large scale and you have a crisis. Now, in response, the government had to set in. Now, if it was just capitalism, we should have probably let them die. But the government said, no, we will bail out all of these banks by printing money and literally giving it to them so they don't lose all these jobs. Now, there are a lot of conspiracy theories around why this happened. You can check out YouTube. But the point is, a lot of money was printed, inflation went up, and these banks were bailed out. And some of them obviously were left to die. Now, why am I telling you all of this? This is connected to what's happening in China or might happen in China. So let's talk about China. Now, you probably think houses to buy near your home are super expensive and probably think the most expensive houses to own are probably in New York, Sydney, or even places like Canada. But the truth is, if you look at this chart, the most expensive places in the world to buy a home is Beijing, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. It's actually many times over or sometimes two to three times the price at London, Tokyo, Vancouver, Sydney and New York. Houses in China are 30 times the average annual income, which makes it super expensive to actually own a home. However, as you can imagine from this that we've done here, 
these people were allowed to buy a lot of homes, a lot of homes. And this comes to the problem. Evergrande, which is China's largest real estate developer, borrowed $300 billion to create houses all across the country, which means now they have a lot of houses that they need to sell to actually make a profit, or at least make back the amount so they can pay the loan they took to build it in the first place. Another company is Sunak China and Shimao China, and last year they actually delayed their loan payments. In fact, Evergrande themselves are not paying interests due on the loans that they've taken. Now, this usually means that things aren't going well. Ronshin China, which is amongst the top 30 developers, is saying that they won't post their audited result. What? Because their auditor resigned. So whenever companies aren't paying up to their vendors or bank interest loans, or say we can't publish our audited result, something is wrong. In fact, Chinese residents are now boycotting EMI payments en masse. I literally mean 86 cities have said that they will stop paying EMIs because their houses aren't ready. So imagine the builder saying, you have to pay a certain amount as they complete the entire residential project. But the real estate developer never completes it and is demanding payment. Therefore, the entire city is saying they will not pay the builder. Now, this is a chicken and egg problem. They don't have the money to build it and neither do they. What happens? It's probably going to be really ugly and like a default, maybe close to the 2008 crisis. What do you think? If you think something like this is happening, put it in the comments below. I'm curious to know what you think. So now that you've understood the entire crisis, let's understand the impact. Now, the impact can be multifold, but I'm going to focus on just two things. So the real risk is the debt that Evergrande has from banks. So Evergrande as a company, although it's massive and big and great and doing all this construction, where does that money come from? It's come from banks, 128 banks, mostly in Europe. And we know where banks get their money. They get it from citizens of the European Union from their savings. And that's lent out to one guy, Evergrande. So as soon as Evergrande, if they ever say, we can't pay, sorry, we don't have the money, it'll actually cause this crazy domino effect where all these banks suddenly have a lot of loan proceeds, which are now essentially non-performing assets. The next thing I'm going to talk about is metal. Now, India is producing a lot of metal. You can look at the price of metal. It's been going up. We know a price of something goes up when we're able to sell a lot or there's a lot of demand. So where is all this demand coming from? Where a lot of this demand is coming from China. If the Evergrande company and other construction companies need to build stuff, they need metal. And metal, India is a big exporter. So much so in 2020, this is how much we exported. And in 2021, this is how much we're exporting in iron ore. This means that there is a huge push from India and China's importing metal from us. Now, if this happens, uh, that net metal export happening from India will suddenly vanish and prices of metal which have been rallying will simply fall. This is not a good thing. The last factor that will affect India is the Chinese government itself. Now, normally we think that when such a situation happens, when a too big to fail company faces such a situation, the government swoops to its rescue and everything becomes okay. But in this case, it's the opposite. China has come out with a forced deleverage plan for all of its real estate developers. Let me explain. The way that real estate works is that you borrow money from banks or other institutions, use that money to build projects, sell it even before the project is built to other payers and keep cycling this money and show unlimited crazy growth. But at some point, this cycle could end, right? And taking so much debt is dangerous, right? So the government said, now, after all this happened, that the real estate companies are forced to deleverage, which means they're not allowed to take loans based on this framework. You see this? This color code of green, yellow, orange, and red shows if a company is allowed to take debt every year or not. So if you're a green company, you can grow your existing debt by 15% year on year. And if you're categorized as a red company, you cannot grow annual debt at all. Now, this is a problem because without debt, 
growth will not happen. Now, the interesting thing is after this rule was out, Evergrande is actually in the red zone. So even if it wants or there are people to give them loans, they just simply can't because the new rules don't allow it. So the writing's on the wall. It seems like Evergrande will actually fail or something terrible may happen very soon. And if that happens, India will obviously be affected. But you tell me, do you think their customers will actually pay up and Evergrande can actually grow? Can it actually grow without credit? What will happen to the metal sector? Chemicals is also something we're exporting to China. Would that sector be affected as well in India? You tell me, you be the judge. I will respond and read every single comment. So please put it there. And if you enjoyed this video, tell your friends about it and hit that subscribe button. Also, if you say something nice, we might like that too. See you in the next video.